Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and the investors who fund them. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SPhase, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing not-for-profit organization for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Tonight, I'm delighted to have with us uh, Constantine Gerick, co-founder of LinkedIn, who I met with earlier uh, this week, and we were talking about um, how networking is a, a skill that startup founders need to work on, need to have as part of their, their capability to help them uncover talent, uncover perhaps co-founders, uh, find routes into investors and so on. So, uh, Constantine, thank you for taking up the offer to come along. Very much appreciate you being here. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so um, you started out with, with LinkedIn because you were interested in uh, networking. Tell us how that came about. H how did you come up with the idea? Why mm -hmm. were you interested in the networking aspect? Well, one advice I have for entrepreneurs is that a lot of times it's not just people sort of expect often the image we have is you're in the shower and you have this great idea yeah. and then you just have to do it and, and it's sudden and then it happens. I think for me it was very much in the case of LinkedIn a very long process where I just throughout my career I worked in startups I just realized how important your network is and, and especially the network of your of your network because each person that you have has their own network and so so often, very often, the, the people that you hire or the investors that you find are in that second degree. So it, that's a realization that I came to. Um, I'm not the only one, you know, had that realization. But um, Reid Hoffman and I met first at an Avatars conference back in 96 or 97 and just talked about this idea back and forth. But then the timing has to be right, which I think is another important thing. So, so, how did, so you, you and, and, and Reid met by chance? Well, we were panelists, but it was okay. also, again, it was kind of a networking aspect to it. So we were both at a conference speaking, but we both had a common friend from Stanford. So we didn't know each other beforehand, but the friend told me, it's like, yeah, that's my, my friend Reid Hoffman. He also went to Stanford. He was a year, I think, ahead or behind me. Um, you know, he's a smart guy. I think you guys will hit it off. You're both kind of very, you've been in startups. You want to do your own. And so that's how we met. And we often would compare, you know, different ideas, mm -hmm. run them by each other as a sounding board and so forth. Because I think that's what you have to do. You can't just think it on your own. You've got to share it with people and get feedback. Okay. And very often we would help each other. So, you know, I remember having some ideas where I needed to talk to people in the tech support industry. I just didn't really know people. But sure enough, Reed had a couple of contacts that he knew and, and he shared them with me and, and we do it vice versa. So how long were you doing this before you formally launched LinkedIn as a company? Well, it was off and on. We talked about the concepts, you know, in 96, 97, then Reed started another company and, and joined PayPal. So for a while he was very busy and then we talked about it some more. And it was not just the two of us, there's, there's five of us who found it. Um, but um, but we just have conversations and think about different ideas and but then there's external market factors when you think like sometimes maybe now the time is right you never know I think there's a lot of luck getting the timing because if you're too early no matter what you do often you cannot succeed and if you're too late obviously too but we saw sort of Friendster you know getting a lot of traction and but we felt the more valuable thing is actually on the business side because um, that's what's our experience. Um, and so, so we just felt, and the timing was right, where Reed, Reed was you know, ready and I was ready to do something, and he had you know, three other guys, um, so the five of us co-founded it in kind of late 2002. In 2002. So quite a long time after you first met Reed. <laughs> yes, and, and, and talked about the yeah. idea. I even, we had domain names that we had ended up not... Uh, you know, someone else bought it in between because we weren't sure if we we're going to do it. And you know, I still have a whole number of ideas in various stages, and I'm sure Reed has as well. And that's um, that's how it happens. I compare it a little bit to whenever I go to LA, people in Hollywood they always have some scripts. You know, that yep. at the right time, <laughs> if they they meet a director, they'll 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 bust it out. Right. Okay. So I mean, now uh, you told me earlier in the week that. Um, you know, LinkedIn, there's a hundred million people on LinkedIn. Well, not quite, but close. But close, all right. Okay. okay. Um, and it's used by all different kinds of people. Did it start out as a broad-based platform? Or were you focused on one particular market sector? Or how did it start out in the early days? 
Well, it, it's very, a lot of it was about trust. I mean, the reason we, we work with networks is because the people that we know, there's a trust with it and you can work much more efficiently with them. But then when you have all these people, you know, it used to be that you really often couldn't find a certain person that you needed. But now on the internet, you have access to millions of people through social networks and through forums and things like that. So it becomes more important, which of these people do I want to work with? And the filtering function and your own network and the trust, the people that they know, that becomes an extremely effective filtering function. And so that's one of the things that we always appreciate because you can get lots of resumes but if one of your coworkers has worked with a person in the past, you just have a much better chance that that employee is going to work out. Maybe even if on paper they don't look perfect. Same thing happened with investments. I mean, a lot of people know that if you just go to a venture capitalist website and submit a business plan, you know, it's, it's very hard to get funded that way. But if an entrepreneur that knows the VC, that has maybe gotten funding before, a limited partner passed something on, because of that trust and because they know that the person who's making the introduction will generally only do it when it benefits both parties because that's good for their own social capital. So it's trust and efficiency really go hand in hand. Mm. And the networks embed that trust. And, and as I said, was it pointed at uh, 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 in initially one specific market sector or was it open to? No, everyone? I mean, the vision was, I mean, we said this is a very general business principle. Okay. Of course, we didn't know how all the industries all over the world work, but I'm from Germany. One of our co-founders mm -hmm. was from France. I'd learned, I'd lived and studied in Asia. And, you know, we saw those principles were very general. So we, from the beginning, set out, we felt like if it can work, it'll be something that appeal, has a worldwide appeal, professionals across industries and functions. But we did think about, you know, how do we test it? You know, does it work for certain people? And one of the things we felt that in order to build a large network, you have to have sort of quality people. You have to have the people that other people are looking for in the network. Because we saw there were some other networks at the time, mm. and one of the issues that they had was that they had people, but they didn't find the people that they were looking for, and, and so they, they kind of stagnated. There were some quality people, but they got lots of people contacting them. And so they didn't see the value, they signed off, and then the network didn't really have that lasting value. So we thought about trust, we thought about quality uh, a great deal when we're designing it and trying to figure out how we could build okay. it. Okay, so um, that was a key thing that separated you from the other uh, networking networks that were de developing at that time. Um, and you certainly s sprinted ahead very far, so now, almost 100 million people. I think you also told me that there's one person signing up every second, right. which, which is phenomenal. <laughs> and that's yeah, just, it's, it's quite amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's just quite astounding. To, to, so to, since we started talking, how many people? Yeah, have there's, there's a whole bunch of people who just signed up for it. Well, I mean, you, you, you work a lot with entrepreneurs and startups. I mean, it, it's, a, it's obviously a passion that you have. Yes. What do you see that, um, often holds entrepreneurs back in terms of their ability to find the people mm -hmm. that they want to try and find. What are the things that you most often see? I think so there's, there's a distinction between network and networking. Okay. So I think every, every professional, um, if you have worked any amount of time, you have a network because you have coworkers mm -hmm. and they know you and, and how strong that network is and what your reputation is depends on your your work as well as how well you communicate with them. But just by working, you get a network. But then you can use networking in addition to that to sort of accelerate that, to get more contacts by attending events and so forth. But events can, and so a lot of times, I think when people think about networking, they only think about attending events. And that's something that's not really comfortable, I think, to a lot of, a lot of people. Um, just sort of being out there and sharing about yourself and so forth. And so I think people, often just think about that. What they don't think about is, here's this network of people that I already know. Because I say, oh, well, none of these people can help me. They're not, you know, of course, if one of my friends would have been a co-founder, I would have done that. But what I think, I try to encourage people to think about each of these people, if you have a network of maybe 150 people, each of them has 150. Now, I need to calculate 150 yeah, times 150, 150 yeah. uh, which is, uh, I don't know, 225,000 or something like that. Um, so that's a very large group of people, and there's a very high likelihood that the 
that a person that fits what you need is in that second degree. But, but without LinkedIn, it hasn't been very accessible because you would just sort of by happenstance talk to somebody and they, hap and they happen to mention somebody like that. But it, you know, there's no systematic way of going about it. So, so we felt that we kind of needed signposts in a row to help direct people there. And I think entrepreneurs need to be encouraged. And it's interesting because we find people on LinkedIn and they're happily interacting, they're reconnecting with old colleagues and staying in touch, but they're not taking that next step to search for somebody you know, especially in that second degree, who can help them? Uh, that, that I think is, is, is a key thing. And it, it's, it's, it's something that I'm only just beginning hmm. to, 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 to work with um, in what I do with the entrepreneurs too. The, the, the value of the second de degree, not the people that you know, hmm. the people that the, the, the people that you know, hmm. know. Exactly. And, and, um, Something I think that uh, you mentioned again when we met earlier in the week, uh, Seth Sternberg of Mebo often talks about you know people group. Yes. They'll go to people of the same height or they'll go and play the same thing. So mm -hmm. how do you find a co-founder, mm -hmm. for example, with complementary skill sets and experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of that? Yeah, so there are sort of two ways. And again, with, it works without LinkedIn. So this is not something that, okay. that wasn't possible before. I mean, and I'd say the old fashioned way is you meet with your people who you think might be connected to those type of people. Maybe if you're looking for a technical person, you know, the chances are more you'll, you'll talk with one of the technical people because people like birds of the feather, their friends kind of resemble them to some extent. So, so you can sort of take a guess and have lunch and, and just ask them, do you know somebody like this and so forth. But that can be, you know, sort of, it's hard often even for myself to remember all the contacts that I have. I often feel like, you know what, now that I know, when I go home, I'll, I'll look through it and see if there's someone who was a fit. Mm -hmm. so, so that works offline. But then online, it's much easier because you just go to a search form. You say, you know, what you're looking for, what companies they've worked in the past, what industry, where they're located, what kind of titles they've had, what other keywords, specialty skills, and you just look through the search results. And then you can sort them by degrees of separation. You can say, just show me the people in my second degree because I want to work with somebody where there's a common connection because that accelerates it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to stay at the second degree. You can pick someone in the third degree or someone even further away that fits perfectly. But for, especially for something like co-founding, you know, that trust is so essential mm. that you know, I think it's a very good idea to, to try to find someone in the second degree. And because the second degree is already so large, there's a very good chance you'll find somebody. And then the, the person who knows both of you, they can make the introduction to, to make you together. And that's a lot more comfortable than sort of cold contacting people. You know, that's why a lot of people aren't salespeople. Um, they're not, you know, they, they feel, especially in a lot of companies get started by more technical people. And I'm, I count myself, I mean, originally I'm an engineer. And, um, but, but getting introduced from someone that knows me and knows the other person is just much more comfortable. I think that that's a key thing, which, which comes up very frequently when mm -hmm. talking, particularly with, the, with, with engineering entrepreneurs. They, they don't want to go to what are called networking e events to meet people. Mm -hmm. They don't think they're very good at networking yes. and they don't want to go and meet people they don't know and try to do small talk. Yes. So the opportunity to be introduced to people mm -hmm. with a, a, uh, a relatively safe ad ad agenda and some trust, as you say, it's, it's been mm -hmm. something that people can do without yes anything else and in the way. And another but factor that helps with that, the way the system is designed, because normally if I, you know, we know each other, but you know, a lot of times, you know, there's only, you know, people often have a group of five or to 10 people that they're very close mm. with. But whenever you have a group of 100 or 150, just think about, you know, you probably just meet them once a year, mm. um, you know, at most. And even then you're pretty active and diligent about it. And a lot of people aren't. But if you then sort of, you, you are kind of concerned about putting the other person on the spot. It's like, do you know someone like that? You know, you're just really asking the person and you're putting the burden on them to think about it and pick and be kind of responsible for it. And they may not be able to think about all of them. So, so, it's, so the intermediary who's the introducer, you know, you, it, it's, it's a barrier to ask them for something. A lot of people, you know, are shy about asking that um, and they don't want to put someone that they know on the spot. When you do it through LinkedIn, where, where your network is mapped out, 
I can I can do the work ahead of time. I can search you know through your contacts, review them, and then if I don't want to on LinkedIn, I can always just talk to you in person and says, you know, I saw you know Tina Smith, and she looks just like she has that kind of background. She seems to be interested in similar things. Um, would you mind introducing me, or can you tell me a little more about her? But but I've now taken a lot of that that effort out of you, and I've sort of picked which is the person in your network that I might want to speak with. So that makes it a lot easier for you. Mm. And it's staggering what the, the depth of the network, even that one step out. Yes. From the, 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 um, the meeting we had earlier this, this, this week, you, um, you got me thinking how badly <laughs> I, I use this, this very valuable tool. And, and so I started looking at things. I was staggered at the breadth of interests mm -hmm. and contacts that there were that one step out. I've got uh, close to 500 contacts mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. And so it was this huge breadth yes. of people that I could tap into. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the breadth, yeah, and the, the diversity of it. Because often your contacts tend to be kind of like you a mm. lot of times. Yeah. And then you have a few who are a little different. Well, when you go into the second degree, each of the ones that are a little different have usually more people that are a little different from you. And, and, and even the people that are like you, just like you, have a couple of people who are in a little different arena. So, so you, you have a much, in your second degree, your network is just much more diverse, which is often what you need. Yeah. Because you have um, maybe an idea from a technology and you want to solve a certain problem, just like I was looking for someone who knew tech support, um, but I didn't have it directly. But, but Reed you know, happened to have a couple of people that, that he was able to introduce me to. So and convinced me that it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and that can be very valuable too before you spend two or three years in it. Right. So if I'm at a party and, 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 and I know some people and they say, oh, I must introduce you to so-and-so, you, you two will get on really well, you should yeah. get to know each other. So that, that's a very personal intro. What, what's the etiquette for mm -hmm. getting to those next level people? Mm -hmm. how, how, how do you approach the person well, that you know and yeah. how do you approach those mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. further out. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, I think everybody has their own style and it's got to be you. I think that's one of the important things in social media. So, so I think, you know, I can give you sort of some suggestions that I think work in general, but one of the most important things is be authentic, be you, depends on your relationship, depends who you're trying to reach. So there's a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of caveats there. But in general, I think there's a couple general rules, which is, is when you want to contact somebody, you know, a friend of somebody, just just describe, to make it easy for, for your contact to introduce you, describe to that person you're trying to reach, what could you do for them? Why will it be interesting to them? Um, because otherwise you put the burden on your contact and, and they don't know as well as you do. So, so, so write it you know, succinctly, not what you want from that person, but what you could offer to them. You could maybe say, you know, this is maybe how you can help me. But keep that, keep that short. But also, People do accept introductions not just based on what I write, but a lot of it is the relationship, what you then say when you make the introduction. If you say, how well do you know me, um, you know, and, and why do you think? Because often it's a certain chemistry thing. And, and I don't think you're always obligated to make an introduction because maybe on paper that person looked like a good fit, but since you know both of us, you know that in some ways our personalities, our sense of humor or something is just very different. And, and then you might say, you know, Constantine, I think that person actually is not a good fit. I think that's, that's totally okay because it would just waste both of your person's time. And when you make an introduction, my general rule of thumb is, I'm thinking, will both people thank me for it afterwards? Um, oh, that's a good one. And it's yeah. a nice, you know, mm. it's, it's kind of, that's a good, good way to think about it. And so if someone thinks the other one, can think about it. Now, what I try to do is if someone asks me for an introduction, I think like, I don't think that's the right person, is I'll try to think of an, another one that is a better fit to kind of help the other thing. Mm. But when you have a network or when you network, I think that's one of the important things is to, to think long term. And uh, these relationships, that network that we have, is there you know, for decades if, if you manage it well. And so you should treat it like a very valuable asset, not like something you consume. So what's the best practice for 
keeping that network mm. fresh yeah. as your network grows. You said there's, there'll be half a dozen people you meet all the time. Mm -hmm. There'll be you know, uh, 20 people you meet semi-regularly. Yeah. And then beyond that, it's sort of, okay, when you get to 500 like, like, like me and like yeah. you, yeah. there's some you go to on there and you say, when, where did I meet these people and why? <laughs> How do you keep that? What's, what's the best practice for keeping that fresh? Because I don't want to spam people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, again, it's very much a personality thing, what works for you, what works for them. But one thing I, I personally like in person, you know, some people are very good with calling people frequently and checking in. For me personally, that doesn't work so well. But mm. I'm very diligent that, you know, every day there's a lunch where I, I use that lunch to stay in touch with one of my contacts. And... Um, and if someone I haven't seen in a while and I feel like I, I really want to make sure I know what's going on with him or her. So if someone asked me for an introduction, I know whether or not, you know, she would welcome it or mm. not, for example. So, so I think lunch is a really good way, but it does not quite scale. No. Because there's only 356 or 65 <laughs> yeah. um, days in a year and there's sometimes weekends. So you could try to do breakfast and lunch and dinner, but for me personally, that's a little too much. Some people do that, and they're very successful at that. Uh, but LinkedIn provides a way to sort of have a lighter touch and ongoing things. So because on LinkedIn, on your homepage, it shows you sort of updates from, uh, from other people. So if somebody, um, you know, changes, starts a new job, and they, they put the new position into LinkedIn, when I look at my page, it'll notify me and saying, this person has a new position. Well, that's a perfect opportunity to write a little note and say, congratulations. By the way, I know somebody else who is working in that same field or somebody who's at that company, say hello. So, so it's, it's a way just not just to reach out, but again, try to make an offer to the other person where you can help them. Because whenever you need help, they'll be much more likely to also help you. And I think good relationships are built not just on words, but on actual deeds where people help each other. A lighter one is simply, and this shows up on LinkedIn, when, when you fill in your birthday on LinkedIn, on your birthday it'll show up that it's your birthday today. So I can drop you know, a little note about that. But also, when I read some interesting article um, that I think you know, has some interesting statistics in it, or I want to share my point of view, then sharing that is also a way to, to kind of add some value and stay in front of the other person so that when there's an opportunity that they're talking with somebody else, you know, that I stay top of mind with you as well because you, you, you see me pop up, you know, either weekly or daily. But the important thing is you know, make sure it's something that's professional that adds some value. Um, you know, sharing my kids' photos, probably in a professional context, not the thing that, that you'd appreciate. Right. That would be only for, you know, very close family members, my godmother or things like that. Right. But you've, you've, you've made a key point there that, that it's um, often the contact is about what I can do for you and not what you can do for me. So uh, 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 people at parties who are, who are often said, oh, that, that, that was a good person to, to meet. You were a good listener yes. rather than a good talker. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you were able to help that person rather than give something back. So uh, are, are there ways that people can, because often people are, are, are nervous about saying, how can I help you in case mm -hmm. they say, oh, you can do this for me. Mm -hmm. uh, are there ways that you, you, you come up with a few ways, maybe an interesting mm -hmm. article or something. Are there, are there some other best practice, some other ways that people can use? Particularly I'm thinking of engineers who don't mm -hmm. network outside their, their circle very easily. Are there mm -hmm. some things they can particularly do to help with that? I think, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is very important is the listening part, because I think if you make it sort of upfront and put it in the spot, what can I do for you? It becomes very transactional. Mm. For some people that works. I mm. mean, really a lot of it is, is, is knowing how to work with people, and, and, but you need to know, you don't want to put them into an awkward spot. Because a lot of people, you know, we, we, especially here in the US, we have a culture where, where somehow we don't want to ask for help. It feels, feels weak. And that's a little different in different cultures. But, but that's one thing where people might say, um, no, you know, I'm okay, I don't need any help. But really they do. So I think it's better rather than saying, you know, what can I help you with is just as you listen, scan the back of your mind. Are there certain people that, 
that might, you know, if you have some, talking about some challenges that you have, and especially entrepreneurs, when you talk to mm. other entrepreneurs. I mean, that's, if an entrepreneur says they have no challenges, they're lying. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, 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 so as long as they, you know, make them feel comfortable mm. sharing things, mm. um, and then think not just about how you can help, but maybe what person can help. So that's one way you can bring, bring your network to help. But you want to find something that's two ways, because you don't want to sort of saddle your friend and just helping that person. So I always look for the win-win, where right. really um, it works for both parties, because that's, that's the ideal. And certainly in, in Silicon Valley, I've found the majority of people that I meet are very willing to be giving in to help. I mean, I don't, it seems to be part of the culture here. Well, so. I think, I, think there, I mean, there's been lots of psychological studies that you know, people who donate and, and give things, that's actually one of the most satisfying things you can do for your mental health. So, mm. so I think helping other people is, um, you know, is, 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 is sort of from your own selfish perspective a good thing. But that's sort of that practical true thing is when you're a person who helps other people, um, you know, other people are more likely to help you. But I think you know, you should think about it just, it's a good thing. Just like, doesn't it feel good to help somebody out and, you know, write them a check or, or help them or give them an unexpected gift? Just, just seeing that, and, and there have been lots of psychological studies that show that. Right, so rather than have it as a strategy, make it become part of the way that you naturally work on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I mean, I, I work with a lot of, so I was a student at Stanford mm -hmm. in the engineering department, but I always had been interested in entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurship classes offered. And so I, you know, I really appreciated when people came in and talked about their experiences with their startups and would take time with me to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So right now I'm in a position to sort of give back to that and be a mentor in some of these classes. And it's a lot of fun, and um, just to be able to do it is very satisfying. Sometimes, you know, before it's like, oh, do I have time? I have one more meeting to do. But whenever I'm on campus and after meeting, you know, with the students and seeing how much they appreciate it, I was like, I think I got more out of it than you did. did. Right. Okay. A lot of people who do teaching feel that, and, and maybe that comes, you know, I, might, I come from a family of two high school teachers and my parents, so, so maybe a little bit of that is in there. Okay, I'm getting the signs that we, we're running out of time, unfortunately, so Constantine, thank you very much for coming on and talking with us. There's a whole load more we should be doing, um, but it's a uh, uh, good night from uh, me, Chris Gill, and Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, and I look forward to seeing you again next month.